Thanks very much. Loads of, loads of stories, stories all day. And um, Sally sort of performed another story. And sort of keeping hold of all these narratives and places and journeys that everyone's been on. And just at this point, I just think it might be nice just to, to think about all the places we've been, but also think about the things that are about to be made, which was sort of the idea of how this came about for me anyway. So it's a hologram, three-dimensional image, a film, an object, and a book. Just, just keep that just hovering around, just because those things are important. Um, what I wanted to do is um, just quickly ask maybe Sally and Francesco just one question each from my point of view um, in relation to their presentations, and then you can open up to any questions you may have, because I think it's probably, hopefully, uh, there should be quite a lot of questions. Um, so, Francesco, thanks very much. <laughs> One of the things that struck me in, the, in your presentation uh, was that you talked about uh, temperature quite a lot. Um, there's transformations in temperature in relation to how molecular structures affect fluid forms, i.e. gaseous or solid or molten. Um, but also you talk about it very humanly and emotionally. I was quite interested in that, both material and social. And then the last thing you showed or presented was the performance with the, the, the licking. And there seemed for me to be two sort of things going on at the same time, which you could describe as maybe cold and hot. Well, I maybe might interpret them. I think the one thing you didn't see in that film was that there's a man reading the text, and a woman is licking, and then it reverses. And then what's this right? And the woman then reads, and then the man leaves. Um, it also seems quite a tortuous thing to, to, to present someone with a performer to be looking sort. It seems quite horrendous to impose that on someone. So just, I just wanted, I wondered if you could comment about this sort of quite cold and almost aggressive relationship to the object or the work or the performance and at the same time is this real sort of seduction going on or it's quite hot in a, in a, rom in a romance or in a, in a sexual, a sexual relationship maybe. This is my interpretation, it might be completely <laughs> up the wall but I think temperature just seems relevant. I wonder if we could respond to that. Grazie. <laughs> No, nel, eh, abbiamo visto delle immagini dove ci sono un uomo e una donna, però c'erano anche delle giornate in cui c'erano due donne, perché in tutto i performer erano sei, cinque donne e un uomo. The, in the video we saw a man and a woman, but there were some days where there were two women. We had a total of six performers, uh, five women and one man. Perché era necessario che una coppia, un performer, lo facesse eh, la performance solo una volta a settimana, perché altrimenti eh, ingerire troppo sale sarebbe stato velenoso. It was necessary that every performer acted only once a week, or the ingestion of all that sort would have been poisonous to them. Are you trying to almost killing them? No, loro hanno comunque... Durante il periodo eh, della mostra loro comunque eh, hanno, fatto, hanno seguito una, se una dieta povera di sale per compensare eh, l'assunzione di sale. During the, no, during the time of the exhibition they followed a salt-free diet to compensate what was happening at the exhibition. <laughs> Perché la cosa interessante per me era questo, che il sale, come dire, è alla base dell'organismo è una delle basi dell'organismo, però una quantità eccessiva di sale diventa venenosa come un altra cosa. Because the interesting dimension for me was that salt is one of the uh, constituent elements of the body of our organism, but too much salt can become poison. Pensavo che, mh, come dire, tu immagina un metro cubo di acqua animale, no? Ha una bella massa, una bella consistenza. 
quello che rimane di quest'acqua, di questa massa, alla fine è soltanto questo, questo sale. È la stessa cosa che avviene anche per i corpi magari che si perdono in mare, anche i corpi di chi eh, si perde in mare alla fine diventano sale, l'unica cosa che resta è, è il sale che viene appunto, eh, che si mischia con l'altro sale. E, e di conseguenza, cioè, è questo sale che resta era il sale che doveva essere poi assimilato dal, dal performer. Uh, if you think about it, a cubic meter of seawater is, is, is quite a big, hefty quantity of water, and all that's left once it evaporates is, is this salt. The same happens with bodies which are lost at sea. All that's left with them, of them is salt, which is then mixed up with other salt. The salt that was remaining is the salt that needed to be ingested, internalized by the performers. Infatti la scelta dei performer, il fatto che fossero degli attori professionisti che sono stati pagati per, per fare la performance, cioè è fondamentale perché appunto la performance non doveva essere qualcosa come dire di volontario, cioè era un, un lavoro per cui uno veniva retribuito e non era un lavoro piacevole da fare, però appunto in quanto lavoro veniva così percepito ed eseguito dagli attori. The choice of using professional actors was motivated by the fact that they were paid to actually do this job. These were not volunteers, it was a job, it was unpleasant, they were paid for it. And this is one of the dimensions which I wish to include in what I said. Um, in a sort of Santiago Sierra sort of way. Sì, però penso che, non lo so, credo che sia un po' diverso, perché Solitamente gli le persone che utilizza Santiago Sierra vengono comunque da una situazione sociale diversa, cioè non sono dei performer professionisti. Uh, yes, but in a slightly different way, the, the persons involved in Santiago Sierra are usually not professionals. Un conto è pagare un disoccupato affinché si faccia camminare sopra umiliandolo. One thing is paying an unemployed person so he would walk over something humiliating him. Un conto è pagare un attore professionale. Another thing is paying a professional actor. Thanks. I've got more questions, but um, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to quickly ask Sally something that I was thinking about. She's about characterization that seems to pop up a bit. Um, you were talking about the different voices you have to write in criticism, speeches, art books as well, and i was wondering who's, who's writing crude? What, kind, what, kind, what type of character is writing crude? Could you explain? It's an unbutton to me. I think when I'm writing about art, oh, on, turn around. When I'm writing about art, I'm quite well behaved. Um, but I, I do put the odd joke in. Um, but it's just a relaxed. When you say different voices, writings for these art magazines, etc., I don't see them as different voices. They're all my voice, which is, and I find it difficult to write in any other voice. I find it mm, doable to write in other genres, but I can still hear my own voice in them. So I can, I can write as me putting, doing an impression of a noir writer, for instance, but I can hear that it's my voice in there, which is why the recording and transcription is an important process for me, so that I can actually get totally new voices in there. And the, that, that um, the seminar with the How Does an Engine Work, the guy who runs that seminar, because okay, there isn't a model in the real world for that, I, I went to an SAS fitness manual and I looked at the way that this SAS guy wrote and then I also interleaved that with the methodologies of a speech coach. So you, you have this, these two self-conscious voices intermingled in a, in a new approximation of a character that could never exist. So there are different levels of construction that go on, but it's all, it's all just me down the pub, really. <laughs> and the criticism is it? Yeah, that is too. Okay. okay. Um, questions? Yeah. That would be great to open up because um, there's lots, there's lots to say. So, um, just wondered, I mean, Please feel free and remember that um, it's a nice opportunity just to talk. So if there's any questions about anything, going back through Beatrice, Romandus, Francesco and Sally's talks, I think it would be great to have a question. Uh, yeah, no reason.
Um, in this talk about stories and histories and other people's stories, um, I'd be interested in hearing responses on, as artists, where authorship fits in with using histories and stories and other people's voices, and how much of that is just pointing at things that we like, or is it the way that a band can do a cover version of a song and it's still really fantastic, even if it's a cover version. Uh, anyone? I guess tying into that idea from this morning about control and authorship and then relinquishing that control and how that relates to using other people's stories and histories. How, how about, I mean, I mean, you were just talking about ethics, but do you think you're being a bit voyeuristic with using some of those podcasts? No, no, not at all. Um, I, I'm quite up for being a little bit exploitative these days. I think the days for us being rather overbearingly moralising about that sort of thing, is, I, I slightly lost patience with it because it seems rather hypocritical because there's all sorts of usage going on at all times. Uh, but the idea of using other people's stories and, and histories and sucking them into one's own narrative frameworks, as you say, a cover story, a cover version can still be great because I don't think we have too many qualms about novelty, authenticity, being the first to do anything, particularly in the art world, it's, that's more of a kind of marketplace or media-driven sort of concern, I think, the idea of novelty. So uh, I, I absorb anything I come across into thinking, um, and so consequently, therefore, doing in writing as well. Is that a bit over liberal there? You, you sound a bit amb ambivalent about it. Yeah, I guess. Do you think there's a problem? No, I, I kind of don't want it to be a problem. I feel like it's imposed as being a problem sometimes. But but I agree that it shouldn't be. But I think there's still some context in which for me to feel it is. I think an openness in terms of what we are inflected by can only be a good thing. Surely it's just a question of what I'm talking about. Surely it's just a question of um, how it's done. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong, it's like abstract paintings band or something. But maybe a lot of it is, but actually, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, <laughs> but you, can, you know, it's a, it's a method, it's a process. It's what, you, know, you, you can't feel guilty or, because it's, in the end, it's how, it, how it's used, how it performs, how it operates in sets of relations. Which is massively good, yeah. That's very positive. But yeah, sure. If that makes sense. Do you, uh, Sally, do your, char do your characters have control over their destiny? Uh, no one has any control, not even me. No, it's up to, it's up to people like um, the person I'm trying to get to let me go onto an oil rig, you know. I'm making everything external because I'm advocating responsibility. Advocating? No, abdicating responsibility. Um, it's part of the midlife crisis. Can't commit. <laughs> Can I say also? Yeah, I don't know. For me, it's I don't know um, if it, if I'm thinking about it in terms of ethics so much anymore. But more, maybe maybe it's more about in relation to the. Um, to fiction versus the document, and the idea that kind of things are always authored. Um, the document is always also authored, and so yeah, I can't think of the point very clearly. But I think thinking about it in, in those terms maybe brings up the issue of what should interesting me also um, in terms of how to represent the representation of, of voices. Okay, Do you think I was thinking, I was thinking of documentation in relation to? Raymond, this is work and yours actually this morning. Because it, 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 the hologram becomes a, a representation or a documentation of an event. Mm -hmm. no? no? No, hologram is an autonomous system of references and possibilities. So it has its own presence. It has its own logic that I'm not fully 
even aware of. I mean, as I was explaining, it's not causalistic, but I don't know yet what kind of language gets produced by that logic. But it doesn't represent something else behind itself. Is it representing or standing in for the relations that produced it? It produces relations. Between the makers, the collaborative team, partnerships, yes, and, and the spectator and the image. Definitely. How do, Beatrice, how do you feel about... Uh, <laughs> how, how do, you, do, you have, do you feel like there's a responsibility to document the... The thing, the big project that you did with all these voices and stuff, is that in the, in the film, in the final work? I think um, that, that, that the film I've just made is very much a, doc a document, in, but in sort of fictional, in fictional form. And one of the things that I really um, love about the original Kaji score is, well, maybe that's something I didn't explain, but um, <laughs> but. Um, Kaji's score, so it's um, it's kind of in the form of a nursery rhyme. It's a very beautiful little um, sort of poem, really. Um, but it's based on, it's actually a portrait of a set of um, relations between a group of musicians called AMM. So, um, AMM were like a radical improv uh, group in the 60s, and Kaji wrote the score kind of as a provocation, because you clearly can't score um, improvisation. So, so the tiger's mind sits in this weird place between being a portrait and a, a, of these of these musicians and a document of um, of their relations, but also a music producing text. And it, I got really interested in that in relation to filmmaking, my own filmmaking practice in terms of how you can um, make something that's at the same time a document of something, but also a fiction that stands on its own two feet, or even something more hologrammatic, like fiction producing machine. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, it seems to me that a lot of the discussions um, have, has come from um, a sort of the personal subjective. It's gone through everybody's work in different ways, and it might be because we're a if you're in a conference or talking situation, you have to talk about where you've come from to talk about the thing that you present. But I'm also curious about the, if, whether subjectivity needs to be your the personal subjectivity or the personal subject, as it were, has to be still evident at the um, when we get the final piece of work. Like, would I still would I need to recognise would I would I want to recognise Sally when I read about Ida? Would I want to recognise um, uh, my grand, the, the relationship of my grandparents' um, uh, tiles. When I see the piece of work, which is about the, the, the walking around the the, the journey the corridor, um, I, 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 I'm, I might be from a generation where I think the subjectivity should sort of be burned up in the making. Uh, cioè tutto affoga nell'opera, ogni riferimento, ogni storia affoga nel lavoro, no? affoga nell'oggetto. Quello che si vede alla fine è l'oggetto, tutto il resto poi sta dentro. L'artista a volte lo racconta, oppure lo raccontano altri, però quello che c'è, come dire, è appunto è lì, è il pezzo di pietra, è il monolite. È e il resto però c'è, ma è appunto al dentro. No, I don't think subjectivity should be seen at all. It all sinks, actually the word used is all drowns into the object. It sinks down into the object. The subjectivity is obviously there, but it can't be seen. It is inside. Sometimes the artist might tell the tale of this subjectivity, or others might speak about it, but all you see before you is a block of earth, stone, a monolith, just the work of art. I'm up for grotesquing my own subjectivity. This is this is my my kind of private project, the aspect of the book that I am um, enjoying from a subjective position. I'm just taking the rise out of myself, really. So I will be recognisable, but I'll be really grotesque, and um, it's a mode of auto criticism, I think, rather than indulgence.
could, could I ask um, Francesco if um, where where, do, where where is it best for the stories to reside that cloak the objects you make? For example, you've, you've, you've offered them to the, today. And maybe there's bits that come in criticism or reviews or press releases. How important is the placement of the stories? È difficile. Come dire, dove è importante che, che le storie risiedano, che si fa. Io penso che sia importante che le storie risiedano dietro l'occhio. It, it's hard to say, uh, but it's hard to say where the work of art should reside. I think the best place is just behind the eye. I'll explain why. Perché, come dire, perché se risiedono dietro l'occhio, a un certo punto riflettono un altro sguardo anche. Cioè le storie, appunto, dietro l'occhio devono entrare e poi si devono, devono collassare, no? Devono perdersi, si devono sedimentare insieme ad altre cose. Appunto, cioè, le storie alla fine sono come, come le pietre di cui parlavamo prima oggi qui alla... visto che siamo nel, nel, nell'istituzione. Cioè, è, è appunto uno stratificarsi di cose, uno stratificarsi di... un sedimentarsi di vicende, di cose che, che si fermano dietro l'occhio e poi formano lo sguardo. Behind the eye is the best place to be. They, it's the best place to reflect another gaze. They come in, they break down, they sediment, they stratify. They're a little bit like those, those rocks, those pieces of earth we were talking about. Once again, we refer to the geological society uh, hosting us here today. Um, the stories and the histories break down there and then form in turn a new gaze outward. Um, yeah, I'm just wary of me just going off and on, but I, I was just going back to this uh, temperature thing of, of cold and warm. And there seems to be a sort of strategy of removal or absence or even endeavour to, to get close to a story on your part. Sally, on the other hand, couldn't be more close, it seems. Maybe with that, the temperature's high and warm, close, human, physical, coming out of your ass, as you, as you said. Um, what, what, what's the remove? What's the cold? Why, why is the coldness or the distance important? La distanza, cioè su, per alcune, su alcune vicende la distanza è fondamentale anche perché non ci può essere una vera vicinanza. Cioè, quando io parlo della gente che arriva a Lampedusa, per esempio, io non posso avere una reale vicinanza. Cioè, i, le esperienze di vita sono talmente diverse che è attraverso la differenza, eh, attraverso la differenza mi posso avvicinare, attraverso la differenza io posso percepire quella temperatura di cui parlavamo. Poi io per questa temperatura bisogna di raffreddarla. Fundamental, sometimes closeness is impossible. For example, in the predicament of the, of the people of Lampedusa, it is absolutely unthinkable to come close to that experience. It's so different from mine. There is a hiatus, basically, that, that I can only perceive what's happening. I can only perceive the dimension of existence through a discrepancy and through a distance. This gives me a temperature, it gauges the temperature, which I then need to cool down in order for it to be digested. Once it cools down, it, all that's left is a, is, is a core, a pit, a stone, an internal congealment of what the uh, external event had been. This infinite distance is the measure of my possibility to understand the event. Yeah, so a, pro a, a proximity to it. A correlation. That's correct. Cool. Is there any um, 
How do you feel, Francesco, when you set out the tiles in the in your grandmother's old house in the hallway about setting a parameter that you can only walk on it if you walk round it 96 times, or I can't exactly remember how many times it was. But that's restricting, that's saying, yes, we can, we're liberated, we can walk on it, but then you're really quenching that by saying you have to do it 96 times. And how do you let them know when you walk in the gallery as well? The, the information is conveyed through the very title of the piece. Eh, poi come dire, io, io non ti obbligo. Cioè, se tu decidi di salire sulla scultura, la mia richiesta è quella di percorrerla 93 volte. Però tu puoi anche non salirci. Così come tu puoi anche salirci e percorrerla 10 volte anziché 93. Poi è una questione tua, cioè non è che io sto lì a contare quante volte giri sopra la scultura. Eh, io gradirei che tu per um, completare l'opera I, anybody can climb up to the to, to the tiles once they're set out and go around it 10 times instead of 93 times is the correct number um, I make the uh, the guest, the visitor, the spectator, aware of the fact that I would appreciate him or her to complete my work of art by following my instruction. My work of art is really just a guideline. The visitor can complete it with his contribution through my instruction if he or she so wishes. Um, other than that, no, I can't coerce them in any way and I, I won't. Do you think that's asking a lot from the viewer? Credo che si richiede molto in questo modo allo spettatore. So like set your rules because you have to conform. Beh, sì, l'opera è mia, di conseguenza io istituisco le regole. Yes, it's my work, I make the rules. Tu puoi anche non farlo, come puoi entrare al cinema a vedere solo 10 minuti di film e poi andare via. You can choose not to execute my instructions, like you can go to the cinema, watch 10 minutes and leave. Ma se lo vuoi vedere tutto, devi aspettare 90 minuti. If you want to see the whole film, it's 90 minutes and that's what you've got to wait. Um, it's about the hypnot hypnotizing. Um, I just wondered why that method was used and the idea of holding an exhibition in a thought and for you to use hypnotizing to, to hold that thought or to kind of um, I just th I just thought there was many there's lots of ways to understand somebody thinking and why that such a kind of strict oh, I, I don't want to say strict I, just, I was just wondering why that way <laughs> it has that, I mean it has that aspect of an experiment but I think I was thinking how to transmit a certain content, or how to generate a certain content, uh, without spatial, physical devices. And still it's very physical, it's about the voice. I mean, when Marcos tells those stories, I mean, you listen to his voice, it's super physical. But somehow it just seemed to me like the most appropriate technique to work on that exhibition in the mind. Um, um, I just had this thought that the, the film Heart of Glass by Werner Herzog yeah. is kind of people who look something slightly different about them and I was just trying to imagine what what these people look like as they're being read the stories is it, do they have that kind of okay <laughs> there we go okay right. you just follow yeah I mean they just sit off reclining, closed eyes, listening. Some fall asleep, which is not recommended because then you miss the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all I have to ask. I was just talking with B about that B has undergone hypnosis. Is that last week? Yeah. We, um, uh, there was some, I can't remember his name, but, um, uh, I'm, I'm right in thinking you have to want it or be complicit somehow. At the beginning, you have to have a personality which is open to being taken on a journey or taken somewhere else. Ah, uh, how's that? Is that? That's quite a. 
that sort of negates quite a lot of spectators. Or, you know, you have to already be able to see the exhibition before you... Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I'm just, you have to... Um, that you're going to open up to this person and you will follow what that person is saying. Not necessarily like in terms of like uh, executing what is being said, but you will open up to this other person who is telling you to relax and to listen. So it's a lot about collaboration in that sense because you sort of you work together and you don't do anything against their will. I mean, even like in a stage hypnosis, when you see people, let's say, barking and becoming animals, they do it because they want to do it. Do you think there's a, there's a similar relationship, like suspending your disbelief and maybe looking at Caravaggio or something, where you have to, you have a, as a contract, in a sense, between a spectator and a maker, where you, you're allowing yourself to be complicit? to believe that a, a body is really there. I don't know. I think as regular viewers of art, we're quite well disposed to to engage with something on its terms. I think you're, you've already filtered out a number of people who wouldn't be open to that by situating it in the art context. Yeah, we can, we can stand in front of ridiculous objects. And, uh, and we'll consider them incredibly seriously. <laughs> so we're really quite biddable already, I think, just by dint of being involved in art. Are we cynical as well? Yeah, I was going to say, we're also very cynical. Um, um, my my reaction to being hypnotised was really conservative, actually. I totally was like, oh, I'm not going there, you idiot, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but I think we're slow release cynics. I don't think we're immediately cynical going, no, I'm not doing that. And then we go, I'll give it a go. God, it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> But as for why, when you asked why you use hypnotism, my experience, well, he, the, the guy Marcus said that it's about achieving a state of trance whereby normal pragmatic situations fall away. And this happens daily. An example he gave was when you shake hands with somebody and you meet them, and it's a ritual, and the point of ritual is to enter this trance state. So that's why you never remember anyone's name. You can shake hands with them because you're suddenly in a trance. Oh yeah, I know this, this is a ritual. <laughs> <laughs> so your your brain operates in a slightly different relationship to information in this state. So that's kind of why it's a good way of inserting <coughs> particular forms in there. Yeah. Come quando guidi e a un certo un certo punto arrivi in un punto con l'auto, ti rendi conto che hai guidato senza renderti conto della strada che hai fatto perché così a me succede sempre. It's like driving, you reach a spot and you know you've been driving but you're not aware of the intermediate points between your starting point and your end point. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> 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 Okay, we're getting near to the end, really, but if there's any last questions, we still we can have a couple before. At the end, hello, Patrick. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question yet, so um, I'm going to try and formulate something. Um, and it might be disparate, but that's a reflection on how um, this session today has kind of sent me off in some very interesting areas of thought, and um, it's been very engaging. Um, there's been re often reference to psychoanalysis, hypnosis, and states of crisis, midlife crisis, um, and ideas of losing control. And I was kind of interested in this idea of when we talk about losing control as artists, what that actually um, is an assumption of. It makes an assumption, perhaps, of control uh, that we may uh, take for granted. And when we talk about um, bringing in voices, I just wonder how that might um, be thought of in relation to perhaps the majority of the population that struggle to achieve any sense of singular voice or agency themselves. 
And going on from that, when we talk about subjectivity or a distance, doesn't a distance of subjectivity is, uh, necess necessitates a privileged position? Um, and when that's in relation to people that perhaps are outside of that position of privilege, how does that work? How does that work in, with art? And Sally, I was interested in you saying that you abdicated responsibility. Because to me, the idea of grotesque in one's subjectivity is, is possibly one of the most responsible positions we can have um, in communicating. I'm, I'm abdicating responsibility for the plot. Okay. I, I take immense responsibility for many other things, but just that plot, I have no, I have no idea, really. But yeah, you're quite right. I'm um, also in difficult, in a, in a difficult conversation with that idea of privilege and subjectivity. And every day, I can't help thinking how incredible it is that we are allowed to do what we do when um, so many people have to deliver the post. We're very, very lucky. Um, but that, that's a ridiculous point to end on. Uh, <laughs> 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 but we are. I don't know if this privilege is like this. It's like a privilege. It's a work. È un lavoro che ognuno poi cerca di fare nel migliore dei modi. Il suo privilegio, sì, il privilegio perché si può fare quello che si vuole fare, però non è che essere un artista è comunque un privilegio. I'm not sure about the privilege uh, issue. It's, it's a job, meaning it's a task, it's a, it's a work we carry out as best we can. Uh, the privilege is in doing things we like and carrying out tasks we enjoy carrying out. Um, but the, the, our outlook on the world is not a privilege notwithstanding in, in itself. We have to start from the point of the point that what we do is not that all the other people want to do. Because there is people who like to do other things. There is people who like to bring the post. C'è gente a cui piace lavorare in supermercato, c'è gente a cui piace insegnare e, e si sentono magari privilegiati anche loro perché possono fare quello che vogliono. Our point of departure in, in, in this discourse should not be that other people don't necessarily like delivering the post or working in supermarkets or teaching. They might feel perfectly well privileged doing that. Uh, not necessarily everybody wants to do what we do. Oh <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't necessarily referring to the artist's privileged position, perhaps just in reference to uh, subjectivity that one can articulate a voice. Eh sì, ho capito, ma non tutti la vogliono, ma non tutti magari ne sentono la necessità, non tutti, non, non, non so, è davvero così soggettivo, appunto, guarda, è così soggettivo che dobbiamo un attimo forse spogliarci da questa cosa che il, il nostro modo è giusto ed è, ed è l'unico e magari tanta altra gente non vuole uno sguardo soggettivo. I understand what you mean about the privilege, meaning not being an artist but having an individual voice or viewpoint, but um, I would still insist on the fact that not everybody wants this, not everybody necessarily wishes to have their own voice and the whole analysis is so subjective that perhaps to understand it we need to step out of our subjectivity in order to see that other people might be perfectly happy not having their own voice in that sense. Um, maybe just before, I ju I just maybe my interpretation and one reason is uh, the, there, there are people that, that have problems with their own subjectivity in relation to identity, for example. Um, they have very many voices in the psych you know, psychologically, schizophrenia or Is there a danger, this is my interpretation of the problem, but it might be wrong, is there a danger that we're sort of using these, um, these discussions or these methods of making which Am I, am I sort of, is, am I interpreting this question right or not? That are sort of undermining or, or fetishizing uh, a way of thinking which 
No, I was just thinking about relating to what we might call a discursive object. Um, how does a discourse become a dialogue? If you, if you, how does the artwork engender a dialogue? That may be. Um, it's as generous with its, uh, its terms of discourse that it is in, its, in the way it takes from us. Quella però è la cosa interessante dell'arte, che proprio magari perché a volte è un discorso. I think that's, un that's the interesting interpretation of art. Sometimes it's not a dialogue, it's a discourse, it can be assertive. And, but even when it's assertive, even when it states rather than engages, it's still an open question, it's shaded, it's shrouded, it's not exhaustive necessarily. Okay, I think that's about it. We're a bit over anyway. Um, I, I just want to thank so much the presentations today, the artists that have come from afar and have been able to talk sometimes in the middle of projects, which as we all know is the hardest thing to do. Um, I really appreciate that endeavor. Um, it's been very interesting for me, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.